guys. Welcome back to Revive School. Uh, here we are in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We're in Lesson 20, written by Dr. Luke. This is the second volume of the Gospel of Luke, and now the Acts of the Apostles, how they go together. That's what I love. Basically, you got a, a bunch of guys, right, that are learning from Jesus. And as they're learning from Jesus, now they got to walk it out with authority. And that's really what you see. Your one word for the book of Acts is authority. Can we walk out what he has asked us to do? And when you realize the Holy Spirit has given you authority, yes and amen, you can do that. Now you have the first missionary journey. You have the second missionary journey. And then you have the third missionary journey that's basically going to go from Acts 18, 22, really through Acts 21, uh, through verses seven, all the way up to verse 17. And so it starts in Acts 13, and then you go to Acts 21. It's a big picture of Paul's missionary journeys. And so as we begin to jump in today into Acts 20, verse 1, it, it really becomes what, what Warren Weirdsby says, a farewell journey. It's almost like he's going back through land to say, see you later, guys. It's kind of an interesting perspective. But now remember this, okay? So here you have the third missionary journey. We were in yesterday. We were in Ephesus, right? In Ephesus, he was there for, Kevin, how long? The school-wise. Two years. Two years, but we know he was there for three years, right? And then Timothy was supposed to come in after him. Now, this is the process. It says after there, there was a big uproar. You know what happens, right? When, when the word of God starts to penetrate all of the community, the riots begin. So that's what you see at the end of Acts 19. You have uh, the demonism defeated in Ephesus. You've got a riot taking off in Ephesus. And so after saying this in verse 41, after this, this assembly, this gathering, right? Says he dismissed the gathering. And then that's, that's the process of Acts 20, verse 1. Okay, Acts 20, verse 1, it says this. It says, after the uproar uh, was over, so all this chaos was over, Paul sent for the disciples. He encouraged them. And after saying goodbye, he departed to go to Macedonia. All right, so now here we are in Ephesus. And now he's what? He's going to head. Remember, it started the third missionary journey. started in Antioch. He's going to go to Ephesus. Now, if he's going to Macedonia, the last time he was told to go to Macedonia was in a vision. Right. So now he's saying goodbye to his disciples, the ones that he poured into for years. And in verse two, it says this. And when he had passed through those areas and exhorted them at length, he came to Greece. So basically what you see is this top arrow. He's going through these communities. Right. Remember, he passed through Apollonia and Amphip Amphipolis. He never stopped there. But remember Thessalonica, which was where Lydia's from. Right. He went into Berea and then it says he continued on and then he went through this area. So he's going into Greece. He's going into Achaia. And so then it says in verse three, that's where he stayed for three months. Now, his whole plan was, and this would make sense, right? If you are literally here, if you're in Achaia, Athens and Corinth, you're coming to the water. His plan is, is that scripture says he was about to set sail for Syria. But a decision was made to go back through Macedonia. Here's the deal. Somebody was going to kill him if he shows up in Syria. So that's good enough for me. I think we'll go a different direction. That's really what happened. He was ready to go to Syria, a, plat, a plot from the Jewish people planning to kill him. And they said, you know, we don't, we don't really need to go to Syria. Let's just go back to the other way. And so here's what you're going to see. OK, so part of his decision was one is the Jews plotted to <laughs> kill him. You're going to see over the course of time that there is opposition from fellow countrymen. Kevin, can you go to 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six? All right. So now look at all this. Uh, this is all the opposition that Paul sees. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea and dangers among false brothers. So Let's just call it out as it is. Even though he was going to see experience and hardship here, just because he's going another direction, it doesn't mean that he's not going to experience hardships. It doesn't mean that he's going to experience opposition. And in fact, many people, bottom line is, is they hated Paul because of the debacle before Galileo. What's he talking about? Galileo. Yeah, he was the a pro-council. Yeah, Galileo, Galileo. Oh, Lord. Let's go to one more. And obviously, one of the other reasons that he's hated is because of, and I think this is, sometimes I don't like using this word, but the conversions. Because uh, you guys remember uh, Sosthenes and Crispus? 
All right, so Christmas and Sosthenes, here you're going to have people that, the, the point is, is, is that many reasons of why and what Paul's going to experience. That's the bottom line. So just because he goes one way and he goes another, it doesn't mean he's not going to see it somewhere else. It's not like he's running completely for his life because he's pretty sure he knows he's going to experience this. And in fact, in verse 4, <laughs> Galileo, you know what? That's just great. In verse 4 of Acts 20, it says he was accompanied by Sopater. All right, so what do you mean he's accompanied? Well, he's going back through Macedonia, which means he now has his friends. He now has his co-laborers. So he has Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Beroia, Berea, Arisarchus and Sycadus, Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy and Tychus and Trophimus from Asia. Which, just so you know, here you have is what we're talking about with Timothy. Okay, so now let's just keep going on. These men went ahead and waited for us in Troas. Okay, Kevin, are you following all this? I thought he was accompanied by them. How did they send I know, that's what bothers me. We're with you. Uh, we're going to go ahead. They went on ahead and they waited for us in Troas. So the only thing I could say is, is that us, it would be Luke. So Luke and Paul, right, in verse 6, it says that they were in Philippi. Okay, so here they are in Philippi. Those guys are in Troas waiting for them to show up. Uh, but we sailed away, away from Philippi, after the days of the unleavened bread, Passover. And in five days, we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. Okay, so now everybody gets this. Here they are in Philippi. They're going to go to Troas. Normally, okay, I think this is an interesting, okay? Normally, this would only take two days. Go to Acts 16, verse 11. So Paul's earlier crossing from Troas to Nopolis, you know, Philippi's port had taken only, uh, uh, 1611, had only taken two days. Then setting sail from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and then the next day to Nopolis. So here you have a two day journey, but now all of a sudden, Kevin, if you'll see in verse six, in five days, we reached them at Troas. I don't know, just little things like that. I think sometimes on the journey, you're like, this isn't what we experienced. Why is this harder? Because life is never the same. Even if you're in the same region, even if you're in the same area, but eventually, I think this is kind of cool, eventually they literally get to have a farewell service that's going to begin to take place. He's on his journey, he's saying goodbye, but now we're walking into a farewell service. I mean, what does this look like? Well, it says in verse 7, on the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he extended his message until midnight. That was nice of him. You know, I know how Paul feels. There's a lot of guys that fall asleep on Paul when he's preaching. Uh, just be glad that if you fall asleep and revive school, nobody falls outside of a window. Kevin, you have any comments? <laughs> Is he even awake? Did he even hear this? Amen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now watch this. Okay, on the first day of the week, I just kind of want to talk about Sabbath for a second. Okay, on the first day of the week in this context, Kevin, what day is this? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. On the Lord's Day, right? So now Scripture does not, uh-oh, here it is. Scripture does not require Christians to observe the Saturday Sabbath. The Sabbath was a sign of the Mosaic Covenant. Would you guys agree? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sabbath was a sign of the Mosaic Covenant. Can you go to Exodus 31, verse 16 and 17? I just want us to be freed from, from feeling legalistic. It says the Israelites must observe the Sabbath, celebrating it throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Verse 17, it is a sign forever between me and the Israelites. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Verse 16 says the what? Verse 16 says it was, yes, it was a covenant that was established between both God and the Israelites. It doesn't say Gentiles. And in fact, the only thing that the letter said in Acts 15 that the Gentiles were supposed to do was what? Not eat animals that had blood in it, right? Uh, that are strangled. Sexual immorality, you had to stay away from all of that stuff. What else was there, Kevin? You remember that? You're not allowed to eat things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. 
So here you have these four things. The only reason I'm bringing that up is that these are the things that the Jewish people said, please don't offend us. You need to do these things. They didn't say observe Sabbath. I don't know. I, I just I wanted to bring this up because it says on the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. And all I want to just say is amen. But you don't have to be legalistic about you. You have to keep Sabbath in order to do a church service. I just think sometimes people are like, really, what? There's actually no command in the New Testament that says you need to keep it. The first command to keep the Sabbath was not until the time of Moses, which is what we just read. The Jerusalem Council, which we just talked about, did not order believers, Gentiles, to keep the Sabbath. I think that's really important. I think that's where you need to go to for the context of this conversation. And then I think you just need to understand, too, Paul never um, cautioned Christians about breaking Sabbath. Like he just, it wasn't part of his, his language. The New Testament explicitly teaches that Sabbath keeping was not, ready for this one, a requirement. Kevin, can you go to Romans 14, verse 5 for me, please? Romans 14, verse 5. One person considers one day to be of above another day. Someone else considers every day to be the same. Each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. This is really what it comes down to, is which day do you honor and recognize Sabbath and then keep it? I think that's the principle behind this. There are, there are denominations, you guys, that say you have to worship on Saturdays. Sunset to sunset. Friday night to Saturday night. And they say, if you don't, it's not of the Lord. There are some denominations that actually say you're going to hell if you're not a part of that denomination. I think you missed the whole point of the new covenant coming to set us free. Kevin, can you go to Galatians 4, verse 10 and 11? Galatians 4, verse 10 and 11. It said, you observe special days, months, seasons, and years. Verse 11, I am fearful for you that perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. I'm, I'm concerned that you're elevating these days, these holidays to the point where uh, you might have missed the whole point. And then just one more for me, Kevin. Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Scripture just says this, Therefore, don't let anybody judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is the Messiah. I remember when I first came to Dallas, I don't actually know how I got connected, but I used to have a breakfast with a guy who was um, a gentleman of a denomination that believed you had to worship on Saturdays. And man, I'll just tell you, he told me flat out, like, if I'm not a part of worshiping God on Saturdays, I'm going to hell. Whoops. That's not exactly what we're after here. The only reason I bring up this message is, is that if you go back to verse 7, uh, there is this on the first day of the week mentality. I want to say absolutely on that, uh, on that Sunday, the first day of the week, which is the day of the resurrection, which is why people, why Christians, Gentiles actually worship is because that's the day that Christ was resurrected. That would be the reason that we come together. But you don't have to be legalistic. So now, you ready for this? If your church has church service on Saturday nights, it's okay. You know that, right, Kevin? If a church participates on Sunday morning or they have something on Sunday night, don't get worked up about, well, that's not how we did it in the olden days. Like, don't get caught up on that. Then you're becoming this legalistic person that, that Paul says be careful of. All I'm saying is, is that at some point when you gather, please do gather. It says in Hebrews 10, don't forsake the assembly of gathering. I want us to gather. I just want to make sure everybody understands that you don't have to be legalistic about it. That's all. Sometimes we don't ever have a, a place to, to talk through this. And I just felt like this was very appropriate here. On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Praise the Lord. And Paul spoke to them. And since he was about to depart the next day, he extended his message until midnight. Kevin, is that really what I think it means? Like he was going to talk for a long time. Yeah, this is a long time that he is beginning to take uh, a message. And, you know, you can say break bread. This could mean uh, like a common meal. It could also mean communion. Uh, it could mean that we are fellowshipping through the breaking of the bread. And it says in verse eight, there were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled. 
Like this is classic, you guys. This is just classic. I love the mini lamps uh, because they're probably oil burning lamps, okay? And these oil burning lamps probably were giving off fumes, okay? There's a lot of conversation about what took place here. And it says in verse nine, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill. He sank into a deep sleep. <laughs> As Paul kept on speaking, like, when is this guy gonna stop talking? And when he was overcome by sleep, Eutychus, he fell out the window. <laughs> the reality is, I mean, when it gets late, it's hard to sleep. It doesn't matter where you're at or what it looks like. And Eutychus, Eutychus just couldn't keep up. He fell down from the third story. You wonder if he even knew what happened. <laughs> and it says he was picked up dead. That has to be the worst message of all time. He's preaching and a guy falls out the window, maybe between the ages, according to the Greek, may, maybe seven to 14 years old. The fumes from the oil lamp are kicking in, making me making him tired, the lateness of the hour. Either way, he dozes off, as MacArthur says, he falls out the window and they pick him up and he's a dead body. Here's where it gets weird. In verse 10, it says, but Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, and said, don't be alarmed for his life is in him. I'm sorry, it says he fell on him and embraced him. He hugged a dead body. And he says, don't worry about it, guys. He's coming back to life. Life is inside of him. And they're in a, in a building, in an upper room, which by the way, you don't hear anything about actual church buildings. You know this until the third century. Nowhere in, first, in, in, in scripture do you say, hey, they bought a building, they started it up. It, that just wasn't the case. They always met in houses. So in the context, Paul runs downstairs. They're on the third floor. He runs downstairs. He hugs him. He falls on him. He embraces him. He says, no, everything's going to be fine. And then look what he does. After going upstairs, he breaks bread and then he begins to eat. Meanwhile, dead body down there. Well, at least that's what we think. Paul conversed a considerable time until dawn. And then he left. What about the dead body? What about the little boy? Paul actually leaves you guys. At that point, he does not see the boy come back to life. Is that true? It's true. Let's just go over this again. Paul preaches and pours his heart out. Little boy falls out the window. Three stories. Ah! He falls. Paul goes downstairs. What does it say he does? He falls on him. He hugs him. He embraces him. And he says, don't worry. Life is still inside of him. He's still going to live. And then he goes back up and he finishes his dinner. And in that same time at dawn, he leaves. And in fact, in verse 12, it says, they brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. Makes me think of Matthew 10, 8. If you'll go there, Kevin. Matthew 10, 8. Wow, 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 wow. Matthew 10, 8 says this. This is what Jesus instructs his disciples as they're getting ready to go out for the first time, as they're getting ready to go out and deliver the good news. Here's part of their requirements. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons because you've received free of charge. You need to give free of charge. So I want you to actually go bring the dead back to life. I'll never forget, we were in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, no, I can picture it actually. It's Miami County. And there's a local pastor there. Love this guy, Pastor Aaron. Pastor Aaron said it's either six or seven uh, people that he has seen come back to life. He's an EMT. And they physically have been flatlined, physically have been dead. But God has given Pastor Aaron an incredible uh, faith to say, I believe this verse is true. And so he asks for permission. He prays over the bodies and they, they come back to life. Now, some of us are like, no way, that's not even possible. But if I said, hey, did you know we went on a mission trip to Africa and we saw like four people, they were dead and we prayed over them and whoa, God kicked in and they came back to life. They'd be like, yeah, I, I believe that. It's so weird how we put God in countries and we think God can work there, but he can't work here. That's true. If you brought a missionary from overseas and they told you this story, they'd think it's awesome. If I told you the story and said I did it in Indiana, they'd be like, you're nuts. The reality of what I love about Paul is that Paul actually believed, he's so radical, that this little boy Eutychus who falls outside of a window, he dies, Paul believes he can come back to life. And he says that right away. He says, oh, by the way, his life is in him. In other words, he hasn't gone yet. He's not dead. And then he goes up and eats, partakes in the Lord's Supper. 
He had a considerable time with the others and then, and then he just left. They brought the boy home alive and they were greatly comforted. That, my friends, is an awesome story that took place. Kevin, do you remember which town it took place in? Taurus. Troas. Troas. You got it? So all these people got to experience this. So it says in verse 13, then we went on ahead to the ship and then we sailed for, As uh, oh boy, Essos. And so he went from Troas to Essos. That's what it says. Intending to take Paul, <laughs> inner giggles, intending to take Paul on board there. For these were his instructions, since he himself was going by, by land. Do you see a pattern here? Like Paul's not traveling with his companions, but yet they always meet up. They are always meeting up. In fact, it says this, when he met us at Essos, Essos, we took him on board and then he came and then he came to Mytilene. Troas to Essos to Mytilene. Okay, this is the process and the journey of the third missionary journey. So here they are on board. Mytilene is a chief city of the island of uh, Lesbos. Oh boy, that's another interesting name. Chief city on the island of Lesbos, south of Assos. And in verse 15, sailing from there, what did they do? The next day we arrived off of Chios. Chios. The following day, we crossed over to Samos. And then the next day, scripture says, then they went to Miletus. So basically, this journey is all of a sudden, it feels like it's moving fast now. Scripture continues on. Uh, a couple of things here, just so you know. Chios. It is the birthplace of the Greek poet Homer. <laughs> Did you guys know that? I didn't either. Uh, and then you have Samos is an island off the coast near Ephesus. Miletus is a city in Asia Minor, 30 miles of Ephesus. And so he's just kind of, it doesn't seem like he's staying long. He's just moving on and said in verse 16, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so he would not have to spend time in Asia because he was, here it is, hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So all of a sudden, he's on a mission. He's on a time frame so that he can get to, where's he headed, Kevin? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And in verse 17, now, while he's in Miletus, okay, he's in such a hurry. He sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church from Ephesus. Why? Because he spent two plus three years there, you guys. So he said, could all of the elders come from Ephesus? Could you meet me in Miletus? And when they came to him, he said, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. And Paul begins to describe how he served with them. He served the Lord with all of humility, with tears and the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. That's what we've been talking about, right? And that I did not shrink back from proclaiming to you anything that was profitable or from teaching it to you in public and from house to house. In other words, man, we were in public, we were in the synagogues, we were in the school, we were in house to house. We, we've seen it all, you guys. And I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now I'm on my way to Jerusalem. And it's almost like, and we're going to get to this, because the scripture says, bound in my spirit, something deep in my spirit says, I know where I go. I know where I'm going to go, not knowing what I'm going to encounter there. But he says, except this in verse 23, except that in the town after town, the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. And, and it's like Paul can't get there fast enough. It's like Paul knows this is the third and final missionary journey and he knows he's been called to Jerusalem and he knows that persecution is waiting for him. He knows that, yes, uh, chains and afflictions are waiting for him. And despite all of these signs of the Holy Spirit saying it's coming, it's coming, he takes that as confirmation, not as a, a warning to not go. It's kind of a big deal. Hardship is coming. In verse 24, he says, but I count my life of no value to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Can you go to Matthew 10, verse 38 for me, please. I count my life of no value to myself. Matthew 10, 38. I count my life of no value. Scripture says, and whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Paul gets this. In fact, Matthew 16, verse 24. You're going to see a very similar theme here. Matthew 16, verse 24. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anybody wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. It's almost like Paul says, you know, as I'm here in Miletus, I got to get here because I want to reflect Christ. There's no other way around it. He knows it in his heart of hearts. That's what I got to do. And over and over, you guys, it says in verse 25 of Acts uh, 20, he says, now I know that none of you will ever see my face again. So he's saying goodbye to his best buddies in Ephesus. And everyone I went about preaching the kingdom of God to, I'm never going to see again. Therefore, I testify to you to this day that I am innocent of everyone's blood. In other words, I am, I have been obedient to what God's asked me to do. It's not going to be on me. It's going to be on them. For I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole, the whole plan of God. I'm going to read you what John MacArthur said about the whole plan of God. And I just, I think this is really, you know, to me, the whole plan of God is more than just death, burial, and resurrection. The whole plan of God literally talks through the divine truths of creation, which leads to the election and redemption and justification. It leads to adoption and conversion and sanctification and holiness and holy living. And then it eventually ends up in glorification. That's the whole plan of God. Like it, it's a, a big picture here. And so as you're as you know, he says to the Ephesians, as I'm going to my death, I need you in verse 28 to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock that the Holy Spirit has appointed to you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men will rise up from your own number with deviant doctrines to turn to lure the disciples into following them. Paul is such a pastor. Even though he's functioning as an apostle, he says, guys, I need you to shepherd and steward this thing. Do not let anybody creep in and bring in false theology. In verse 32, he says, and now I commit to you God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I've not coveted anybody's silver or gold or clothing. This is like his farewell message. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my needs, have been a tent maker, and for those who were with me, in every way I've shown you that by laboring like this, it's necessary to help the weak and keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus. For he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And after he said this, I love what, this, what they did. It says he knelt down and he prayed with the elders, with all of them. And there was a great deal of weeping by everybody. They embraced Paul. They kissed him. And grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. And then in Miletus, they escorted Paul down to the ship where Paul could begin his journey, yes, all the way to Jerusalem. It's a pretty powerful picture that even though Paul is so determined and so mission-minded, he wasn't so mission-minded that he didn't love those that he did mission work to. Does that make sense? Like he actually loved those that he poured into probably one of the best lessons you can learn about an apostle is even though they're driven, they still need to be able to pull back and say, man, I love you. I care for you and I'm with you. All right, guys, this is Acts 20. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.